Great Labor Day weekend, everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. As summer starts to wind down, we're going to spend some time this week looking back at some of our favorite stories from the past few months. But first, we're kicking off with Cow-Calf Corner. Here's Dr. Mark Johnson with important information about managing calving during these hot temperatures. Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow-Calf Corner on Sun Up. This week, we follow up Dr. Whitworth's article and interview last week when he was talking about heat stress in Oklahoma with a more specific topic, talking about calving out cows when we're doing it in high temperatures. And after a mild summer in this state, there's no question the high temperatures have arrived here in the past couple weeks, just in time for those fall calving cows to start seeing those calves hit the ground. So we discussed some special consideration and some things to be aware of if we're gonna be calving out cows in the fall during these high temperatures. First of all, I know myself I typically get guilty of thinking that calving in the fall is a lot simpler than calving in the winter and early spring and probably fall prey to that opinion because typically we see less birth weight in our cows that are calving going into fall and it, it has to do with the way cows dissipate heat and the fetus growing and ending up being a little bit smaller by the time that calf is born. But that being said, if a cow gets heat stressed or is calving when we're dealing with really high temperatures, she's a lot more likely to get heat stressed and, and particularly exhausted pretty early on in that process, more so than she might if the temperatures were actually cooler. When that happens, we are going to potentially compromise colostrum intake in that baby calf. That baby calf's going to be stressed too. The whole transfer of passive immunity and subsequent health and weaning weights may tend to go off the rails on us. So having said that, probably our bigger consideration itself is the impact of heat on newborn or even very young calves. When calves are born, their thermoregulating mechanism is immature. They, they don't know how to regulate their body temperature as well as they will later on. So that becomes an issue. It's important to be aware that the thermoneutral zone for a, a newborn or young calf is about 50 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit. And as we talk about this, heat stress is actually harder on young calves and newborns than cold stress is. So some things we wanna make sure we do in the process is have ample shade and water for those calves. We, we often don't think about calves mirroring their mother's behavior within the first few days of life. They're actually gonna go out and start to try to graze some grass. They're gonna drink from the same water sources that their mother does. Uh, fresh, cool water is really critical for baby calves. That moisture gets into their rumen. It's critical for establishing that rumen function and getting them off to a good start there. Obviously, the water itself is gonna be critical to prevent dehydration, which is gonna be really easy to have happen to them whenever the temperatures are high. And they're gonna lose appetite if they get heat stressed and get dehydrated and that rumen's not working. So we got issues there. It's important to consider if we've got black hided calves, they're a lot likely to get heat stressed quicker than calves that are of a lighter shade. With that, good luck having your cows this fall. Hopefully some of this extreme heat will break for us soon. Thanks for joining us on Cow-Calf Corner. We're joined now by Dr. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist. Kim, let's start off with just some information about what's going on in the crop markets this week. Mostly down. You look at the wheat prices early this week, they were down a dime. Uh, cash price around $6.70. You can forward contract for 22 harvest delivery for $6.75 corn was down a quarter. If you go back to mid-June, corn's dropped 90 cents in the market. You forward contract corn now for about $5.15. Soybeans early this week were down 40 cents. They're down $1.80 from mid-June. Uh, forward contract price around $12.15. I'm sure all of that generated some market news. What are you hearing? Well, of course, the hurricane and there's speculation. What's it doing to our bean and corn prop, crops? Uh, I don't think there's much impact there. On wheat, there may be a head and shoulders top. That's a, a figure. If we break that head and shoulders, we could drop 50 cents off. So the, the market's watching that pretty close. Uh, both Pro Farmer and Allendale came out with uh, surveys and both had corn and soybean 
uh, production slightly higher than USDA, and I think that's the reason for some of those lower prices. Of course, we're watching uh, China and Mexico, what's going on there. My guess is you're also watching the fundamentals. What are those? Uh, wheat, you look at the United States. Ending stocks, I think that tells us most everything we need to know. 627 million bushels compared to 844 last year, compared to 1 billion the year before. Hard red winter wheat, 346 million bushels this year, 426 last year, 506 the year before that. Uh, the world, 10.3 billion bushels, last year 10.6, the year before that 10.9, all going down. I think that's good for wheat prices. How does it look for corn? Uh, you look at the situation for corn, uh, there, you look at the uh, production and exports uh, uh, slightly lower than past years. You look at uh, corn production, 14.6 billion bushel. That's up from 14.2 last year. Uh, you look at any stocks, 12.42 billion bushels, up from 1.1, so slightly higher corn stocks. Uh, you can write down forward contract corn for around $5.75. And then round that out with the soybean picture. Beans, remember the Pro Farmer and the Allendale, higher production than USDA, but you're looking at a record 4.4 billion bushel uh, production by USDA. That's up from 4.1. Ending stocks, though, at 155 million bushel. The five year average is 467. Tight, tight stocks. The world on soybeans, 14.1 billion bushel. That's a record. Ending stocks at 3.5. That's slightly lower than last year. So, bottom line, what do the fundamentals tell us about prices? Prices have been moving down, but they, I think they're just adjusting to an equilibrium. With relatively tight stocks, especially with soybeans, with corn, with wheat, lower ending stocks, I think it supports prices well above average. Great explanations, Kim. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next week. Good morning, everyone. Wesley's off this week, so I've got the reins, and we're going to talk about drought and then our prospects for the future. So let's get started. Well, the drought picture is not looking good, especially if you live up in the northwestern parts of the state. Uh, we do have that large area of moderate drought still up in the northwestern corner of the main body of the state and a smaller area of moderate drought out in the western panhandle. But now we also have a small area of uh, the D2 severe drought up there in the northeast corner of Harper County and the northwest corner of Woods County. Let's take a look at our USDA topsoil map. Uh, this is the percent of the state that's percent short to very short for the week ending August 29th. And we see Oklahoma jumped 11 uh, percentage points from last week up to 43%. So the, uh, the latest uh, bout with hot, dry weather has taken a toll on our topsoils, unfortunately. So let's take a look at our August rainfall. We do see some pretty good amounts down in the southeast and scattered about, in, like in west central Oklahoma, far southwest, east central, but a lot of areas with uh, less than an inch or less than two inches of rainfall scattered about. We can see that a little bit more on the uh, departure from normal rainfall map for August, and we do see those deficits across the northern parts of the state, generally ranging from one to three inches, and we see those good surpluses uh, from two to six inches down in the far southeast and parts of south central Oklahoma and scattered about. But in general, most people saw a deficit during August. That's the reason for our sudden uh, ad advancement of drought across parts of the state and also our abnormally dry conditions. The dryness does date back to the beginning of summer for some parts of the state, especially up there in the northwest. Buffalo has received a meager amount of three inches for the last three months, which really won't do much for you if you're trying to uh, uh, raise a crop or, or get ready for planting. Let's take a look at the departure from normal map for the summer, uh, again June through August. We see that buffalo amount up there 6.1 inches below normal. Lots of areas up there in the northwestern part of the state from 2 to 5 to 6 inches below normal and then scattered about uh, down in central and uh, east central Oklahoma. Lots of good amounts down there uh, of surplus down in the far southeast and along that I-44 corridor but the deficits do stand out in that summer departure from normal rainfall map. Okay, let's take a look ahead for the month of September, the U.S. monthly drought outlook from the Climate Prediction Center. 
they do see that drought development being likely uh, across parts of the western panhandle, north central down into east central Oklahoma, generally in the north northern uh, half of the state, uh, also down in the far southwestern corner of the state. So unfortunately if that does come true we're going to see a lot more drought uh, in our state by the time September's finished. Now let's end with some good news. September is normally the third wettest month for the state, at least for most of the state, so hopefully with our secondary rainy season coming on uh, we can delay some of that drought development or just end it completely. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Over the summer, we met some great Oklahomans and had fun sharing their stories. So today, we're taking a look back at some of our favorites, starting with the delayed wheat harvest in Caddo County, thanks to a pretty wet spring. Here's Sunup's Ed Barron. It's a hot, humid Oklahoma day, but Brian Vale is finally harvesting his wheat crop. We're probably a good week, week and a half later than we normally start because of the weather, the rains. That's on top of the conditions during the growing season. Yeah, it's been a pretty extreme year as far as the weather. That cold spell we had in February, I, that, I think that really hurt the wheat a little bit. And then, of course, the late freeze in April. It's been probably two or three in the afternoon before we can get started real good. It's kind of spotty here and there, but it's overall, it's pretty good. Despite the weather, it hasn't dampened the Vale family spirits. It's good quality what we're getting. It's good heavy, heavy 64 pound wheat, 65. The moisture's just really getting dry enough to take it to town. We're just gonna have to get used to those, I guess. It seems like it's happening more often than not. And it, it's definitely got some freeze damage this year. Across Oklahoma, many producers like Brian have had to deal with a delayed harvest. But with combines now rolling across the plains, things are beginning to heat up. Yeah, everybody kind of gets fired up for wheat harvest. It's just kind of a tradition, you know. We don't get as excited about cutting milo or soybeans or whatever else we're harvesting. And wheat harvest is just kind of a big deal. In the Vale family, has been harvesting wheat for a long time. My dad, my granddad, my great granddad started farming in this area. So I'm like a fourth generation farmer. But for exactly how long is up for debate. I guess you might say there's six generations of us. I'm pretty fortunate I got two sons helping me. One's on that combine, another one's running the grain cart. Got a nephew that's driving trucks for us. My dad helps when we get behind. So yeah, it's a pretty family involved deal. Whenever I was just a little boy, they had an old drag combine that they pulled with a tractor and uh, they drug it out of the weeds about harvest time and hooked her up and you run the you run the header with a big old lever, you know, and it's changed so much, I don't hardly get in them anymore, I know that. The life of a farmer is defined by change. Whether it's the change of the seasons, the climate, or the crops, the only thing that's consistent is change. I started no-tilling my stuff about 20 years ago, and so then we started rotating crops, growing more summer crops, more diverse cropping systems, you know, and that kind of, was it enabled me to clean up my fields and have cleaner wheat fields. You know, I'd, I'd like to see it go on, keep it going, that's for sure. And uh, it looks like we're gonna have some grandsons that's interested maybe in farming and kind of keeping things going. So I think it'll go for several years. Until then, Brian and his family will keep farming wheat and continue to challenge the elements. Well, it's just part of it and you just, depending on mother nature to do her part and cut you some slack, you're always at her mercy. We usually bump, bump our way through it. And if this crop, you know, if a wheat crop fails, we go in here and plant a summer crop right behind it. Just no-till it in and hope, hope it works. And usually something will work. <laughs> in Caddo County, I'm Ed Barron. When it comes to tending the garden in these hot, humid days, the earlier the better. 4 H or Kyla Dietrich wants to beat the heat for sure, but more importantly, she wants to get to the produce before the cottontail does. Now we grow zucchini and green beans and okra and uh, watermelon and pumpkins and tomatoes and um, cucumbers and bell peppers and cayenne peppers and jalapenos. With the February winter storm and the general shakeup of the pandemic, 
Kylie's garden is a little behind this year, but when you've been gardening as long as she has, you learn to tread the rough waters to make a crop. When I was born, my parents started a garden, and then as I grew up, I started kind of like helping in the garden. And Well, like she said, it started off when she was young, but from that point on, Kylie's been interested in being out. When we're out here grow up planting and picking up and setting up and uh, getting the garden all in order, she's out here with us. And when I see that they're starting to like produce, we get excited So like, because like, we um, can eat like fresh produce and not have to buy it from the store. But all these good looking fruits and veggies ain't just for the Dietrichs to enjoy. As part of her 4-H project, Kylie donates a lot of what she grows to the less fortunate in her community. And today she's taking a load out to the Mana Pantry in Yukon. It's um, a place where you can donate things and people that like don't have like as much money and need something to eat, they can go there and get what they need and have a meal. You know, when she's handing out those vegetables and the squash and the cucumbers and things of that nature, she lights up just as much as the people she's giving it to lights up, and so it helps both her and them. Um, it makes me feel um, excited that I get to like help someone out and, and make their um, day feel better. Sherry Rogers is the director of the Mana Pantry, and her ministry serves about 250 families a month. She says Kylie's donations are a huge help to the community. A lot of our clients are older, and they love homegrown vegetables. They get so excited when they see homegrown vegetables. It, it just really impresses us, and it means a lot. It means a lot to me that some parents are doing the, a good job, uh, but it means a lot to our clients that they see a younger generation stepping up and, and helping out. For Chad, Watching Kylie dedicate herself to better her community makes him feel the way that, well, the way any parent feels when their child is doing his or her best. Proud. 4-H has been an awesome opportunity for Kylie and she really lights up. It helps her um, with her self-esteem uh, and just like we said earlier, just being able to give back and uh, being a part of her community. In Canadian County, I'm Curtis Hare. Hidden on the back roads of Mounds, Oklahoma, lies Endicott Farms. Our farm is kind of a small specialty crop farm. Um, we have uh, pecan acreage, and then we have a couple acres of blueberries and blackberries. To get into the berries, we started out as an alternate crop to the pecan season, which is a fall season crop. Uh, we were looking for a way to bring people out to the farm and generate revenue, um, and so that kind of led us into blueberries and blackberries. Agritourism is a growing industry in Oklahoma and the Endicotts have taken full advantage of the opportunity. It's a lot easier to have people come pick the berries than it is to, um, than it is to pick them and market them yourself. And so I think from the very beginning, we really had envisioned people coming to the farm to have the experience of coming out here and that they can bring their families, their kids, um, uh, grandparents can come out, spend time picking berries together. Blueberries and blackberries both have a lot of attention right now. You know, just people, they're very popular, trendy fruit almost. People eat them and seem to add them to everything. They have a lot of antioxidants. And so they're kind of a popular fruit right now, especially living cl so close to Tulsa where people didn't have to take a long trip to do it. As of the 2017 census, there were over 800 farms here in Oklahoma that were involved in agritourism, generating about $6.5 million in revenue for those operations. So it's a great opportunity to educate people on agriculture and to generate revenue, not only for that farm, but for the local community as well. You might think business suffered last year due to the pandemic, but the berry business ballooned like Violet Beauregard. It was probably our best year last year. Last year, looking at COVID, we really just looked at the guidelines that existed, you know, that were being put out, and how could we work within those to create a safe picking experience for our customers. Like everybody, we were concerned as uh, COVID was coming about that what were we going to do with our picking season? Were we going to be able to pick or what the situation would be? We streamlined our process <clears throat> so that we didn't have to handle any berries or handle any um, of the buckets or things that people were picking with. We just really kind of streamlined that process for the picker. Um, it really was an outlet for people to get out of town and do something. So people were kind of looking for something to do and they felt like coming out to the farm and the open air space was a good, safe environment to do that. However, the recent weather hampered this year's berry crop. 
in particular the hard freeze on the blueberries, which was the February um, kind of extreme weather freeze. Uh, that one damaged the flower buds on many of our southern varieties. So we're still able to have a picking season this year, but definitely reduced from past years and what we would anticipate. While the berry yields might not be as high, the Endicotts will continue to grow their business. Our goal in the future is just to continue to provide a high quality experience for our customers, making sure that we have a solid crop where people want to come out and pick and have the environment where people feel like it's a pleasant place to come. To come out and just enjoy the space and just take their time and, and pick berries and eat a few while they're doing it, it just is really good for the spirit in a way. I think people just really enjoy doing that. In Okmulgee County, I'm Ed Barron. Wheat and cattle are the backbone of Oklahoma agriculture. However, with dual purpose wheat, timing is everything. First all stem is the critical time in which we decide to remove cattle to go from grazing to grazing termination to now grain production. That first all stem is a critical trigger in making those decisions when to pull the cattle off. But knowing when that is can be a challenge. So it's a lot of time, it's a labor work. So for me, I just wanted to see which gene control the time when we get elongated. Then you clone this gene. Hang on, let's back up to where it all started, when Dr. Yan decided to breed Billings and Duster wheat varieties. We have a pretty good idea on how to predict maturity, whether it's first all stem maturity or heading maturity or actual finishing maturity, but we were never able to make the complete prediction. We had the genes to distinguish many varieties, but we could not distinguish Duster from Billings. Duster, being a dual purpose variety, and Billings, mostly for grain only, have very different maturity rates. But uh, we don't know which gene control this difference. And we know Duster and Billings differ at all three of those stages. So what was the one missing piece? That is the gene that Dr. Yan discovered. And finding that gene is the first step in pinpointing first hollow stem. So this uh, discovery or this gene we cloned will be very useful for the wheat production in the world. I hope there's a day in which we can tell farmers if they have this variety, then, then giving this year, whether it's an earlier year or a later year, you should expect this variety to reach first hollow stem on this date or in this general area of dates, two or three days. We cannot do that yet. This is the piece that will get us there. I think maybe put us there. At Oklahoma State University, I'm Ed Barron. Rushing from school to practice is a part of life for most young athletes. And this is true for Cleveland County 4-H or Elisa Boozer. Though her practices are a little different from the ones you'll find on a soccer pitch or a softball diamond. I have to be as still as possible and focused and everything has to be perfect. Every little tiny detail has to be the same as before. For the past three years, Elisa has immersed herself in the sport of precision shooting. And she's good. Really good. She's qualified for the Junior Olympics, and today she and her coach, Charles, are fine-tuning her skills and preparing for the upcoming trials. Uh, I usually just start out with a warm-up, and then I get into shooting some drills. Her shooting skill is coming along. I'm really pleased with the way she has advanced. She has a ways to go before she's at the Olympic level. When, now that I'm going to the Junior Olympics, I'm more going for the experience because I'm not at the level where I'm like, oh, I want to win this. The goal is simple. Shoot at a target that has a point system of rings ranging from 1 to 10. But when you're standing 33 feet away and aiming at the half of a millimeter 10 point bullseye, achieving this goal is incredibly difficult. To do it once, a lot of people can get there. To do it 60 times in a row, very few people can do it. She can fairly consistently shoot a 580 out of 600, but at the Olympic level, she's going to have to shoot 600 out of 600 consistently. Elisa's love for the art of marksmanship began years ago when her grandfather would take her out shooting, but she never considered pursuing it as a sport because, well, she didn't know a sport like that existed. 
Um, I was just talking with my dad one time in the car because I didn't want to do softball anymore and I didn't want to go back to karate. So I started rattling off a list of Olympic sports and I got down about, I don't know, 10 to 15 down the list and I said, shooting and this and that. And she goes, whoa, 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 wait, shooting is a sport? And I said, yes, it is. And she said, tell me more. And her personality is such that I think it, it, it bodes well for shooting because she's a perfectionist. You know, um, a nine is not an option. It has to be in the middle. Early on, I begin to notice that she has what we kind of refer to as that Olympic spark. And I noticed that she could had that if we could fan it carefully. Something that also helped fan that spark was the Cleveland County 4-H shooting sports program. But 4-H really helps me with like the basics because 4-H is sporter, which is, and this is precision, and so everything to do with the basics is all sporter. 4-H is very critical to her as a shooter because it provides her not only the social ability to interact with other kids that shoot, but also competitive time. Um, the ability to go and compete and be around others um, because uh, outside of maybe one event a year, uh, there's not a lot of events here in Oklahoma for shooters. We have to travel a lot now that she's at the national level. She's been very involved in the shooting sports program. Um, we do. We are kind of trying to steer into those other avenues outside of just shooting sports, um, but she has really taken a shine to shooting sports. That's really her passion. While the Junior Olympic trials have her attention now, Alisa has her sights set on the future. My main like focus goal is being able to get good enough to be on a collegiate team when I get out of high school. College is still a ways off, and for now, Elise is just focusing on being a teenager and sharpening her shooting skills for the national championships in October. Oh, as for the Olympics, she did great, placing fifth in the 14 and under 10 millimeter air rifle category and 128 out of 166 overall. A good experience indeed. In Oklahoma County, I'm Curtis Hare. That'll do it for us this week. A reminder, you can see us anytime on our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. We hope you have a great Labor Day weekend and a wonderful week, and we'll see you next time at SUNUP.